Evening Church, so great to be with you tonight. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Jamie. I'm one of the leaders, the pastor here at ECC. Thanks for joining us for our midweek check-in. Uh, tonight we're going to be hearing from Alistair Cooper, who's going to be bringing us the word uh, from John chapter 6, looking at Jesus' great words when he said, I am the bread of life. Uh, just thinking this through uh, for myself and being reminded of people of old, uh, particularly uh, of someone who has been or continuing to be a, a hero for me, someone that I'm finding great inspiration in as I uh, rediscover his works and, and his life, someone who put his absolute faith in God, that he was the great provider, uh, both of his physical needs and the feeder of his, souls in, of, of his soul, someone in whom he could put his, his trust and come to to be fed, uh, was the life and the testimony of George Muller. Uh, George Muller was a German chap. He was born September 27th, 1805, and he lived almost the entire 19th century. He saw wonderful things like the Great Awakening of 1859, which he said led to the conversion of hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, he uh, was around the same time as William Carey, the famous Baptist missionary, and of course uh, Charles Spurgeon, to name a few people. Uh, he spent uh, most of his life in Bristol, or Bristol, uh, in England and pastored the same church there, incredibly faithful pastor, uh, where he pastored there for over 66 years in this Calvinistic uh, Baptist church. He was known for his preaching and travelling. He covered many, many miles, including over the Atlantic, uh, over to the USA. He did follow-up work for people such as D.L. Moody. He preached for Charles Spurgeon and inspired the missionary faith of wonderful people like Hudson Taylor. So he was a hugely influential uh, person. But perhaps as well as his preaching and his evangelistic endeavours and his travelling, he was most well known uh, around the world in his own lifetime and still today for his orphan ministry. Uh, he built five large orphan houses and cared for over 10,000 orphans in his life. In his journals, uh, Muller recorded miracle after miracle of God's provision and answered prayer. One morning, for example, in his journal, he records how there were all, all the kids were gathered around the dinner table and all their plates and cups and bowls on the table were present but empty. There was no food in the larder and no money to buy food. The children were standing, waiting for their morning meal, and Muller said, well, uh, you know, we can't allow it to delay us going to school, but nonetheless, even though there's nothing here, let's, let's pray to God and ask him for, uh, for help. So he prayed, dear father, uh, we thank thee for what thou art going to give us to eat. And then all of a sudden there was a knock on the door. Uh, there was a baker there standing at the door and said, Mr. Muller, I couldn't sleep last night. Somehow I felt you didn't have bread for breakfast and the Lord wanted me to send you some. So I got up at 2 a.m. and I baked some fresh bread and have brought it here for you and for the kids. Uh, Mr. Bu Muller thanked the baker and no sooner had he left when there was another knock on the door and it was the milkman. He announced that his milk cart had broken down right in front of the orphanage and he would like to give the children his cans of fresh milk so he could empty his wagon and repair it. And what a wonderful answer to, to prayer, God providing the needs of his children uh, through fresh bread and fresh milk. What a man of faith George Muller was, uh, that God trusting, a man that trusted that God would feed his children. For him, not only spiritually, uh, but their physical needs as well. Absolute bet rock solid faith that God would provide and you know he carried on running these orphanages this orphanage uh, all the while he was preaching some say three times a week from between 1830 to 1898 some documents again say over 10,000 times it didn't stop there when he turned 70 he fulfilled a lifelong dream of missionary work which he did from the age of 70 bearing in mind the era that he was in uh, for 17 years until he was 87. A, a hugely uh, influential life. That showed at his funeral, which was held where he had served for 66 years back in that old Calvinistic chapel. Uh, tens of thousands of people reverently stood along the route of a, the simple procession. Men left their workshops and offices, women left their elegant homes or humble kitchens, all seeking to pay a last token of respect. It was said that a thousand children gathered for a service at the orphan house number three. 
they had for now uh, lost, for a second time, lost a father again. Now, looking back at this remarkable life of faith, if you could take anything away from this godly man, it would be that he had a complete trust that God was a sovereign God and that he could just trust him for everything because God was in complete control of his life. He found that in reading uh, the scriptures, which he was said to have re read from end to end almost 200 times. He was a lover of the word. It was in this word he came to know and love this absolute sovereignty of God in the context of the doctrines of grace. He, he just knew that God would provide, that God was sovereign and had his life and his children's lives in his hands. Muller's faith uh, that his prayers would, would be answered, uh, he, he, he was said to say uh, towards the end that uh, how the means are to come, I know not, but I know that God is almighty that the hearts of all are in his hands, and that if he pleaseth to influence persons, they will send help. That is the root of his confidence. God is almighty. The hearts of all the men are in his hands, and when God chooses to influence their hearts, they will give, speaking on how the Lord provided wonderfully uh, bread and milk and, and whatever else it, the needs were of the orphanages. He trusted in the sovereignty of God. In our passage today, we are once again reminded uh, that in God, in the Lord Jesus, we find satisfaction for our souls. All that we need is found in our God who is faithful and provides the needs for his saints. Uh, so Jesus said in John chapter 6 in the Gospel of John, I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. But as I told you, you've seen me and yet you do not believe. Everyone the Father gives me, everyone the Father gives me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of those. I should lose none of those. When we're in his hands, we cannot... Um, we cannot be separated from the love of God. We are in his hands, is what it's saying in verse 9, 39. This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of those he has given me, but should raise them up on the last day. For this is the will of the Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. What a promise. And I'll raise him up on the last day. So, uh, brothers and sisters, we're going to hand over now to Alistair, who's going to help us understand this passage a bit more. So, uh, Lord, we pray that you will speak to us through your word, and that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will give us faith to believe in the Lord Jesus, the one who has said that he is the bread of life. Feed us now, Lord. We come to you spiritually by faith. Would you feed us your children tonight, we pray in your name alone. Amen. My name is Alistair and I'm one of the members of Emmanuel Community Church. Uh, today I just wanted to share some uh, devotional thoughts around John chapter 6. Um, we're currently in a very difficult situation and I suppose the one constant uh, source of comfort that we have is the Word of God. So it's good to turn to God's Word and especially a chapter like John chapter 6 uh, because here we see the reality of who Jesus really is and we see some great details about and the salvation that he's given us and the wonderful hope uh, that we have in him because we are saved and we're secure and nothing can change that. In this chapter we have one of the great I am statements. There are a number of I am statements and Jesus makes a statement, I am the bread of life. He says that in uh, verse 35, Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. So he makes this clear statement to declare himself as the bread of life. And obviously when he says, I am, he's alluding to what God said in Exodus chapter three, when God spoke to Moses and God said, I think it's in verse 14, uh, God spoke and said, I am who I am. And God was telling Moses that he should speak to the people of Israel and tell them that I am, has sent you. 
Through this chapter, you, you'll see repeatedly Jesus talk to the people, talk to the nation of Israel about his deity and his unique relationship uh, with God the Father. He describes himself as the bread of God sent down from heaven in verse 33. Uh, he does come to do the Father's will in verse 38. He states that he has the power to raise people from the dead uh, and that he'll do this in the last day in verse 39. He describes himself as the living bread that has come down from heaven in verse 51. And he says that the living Father has sent him and he lives because of the Father in verse 57. So they're just uh, some of the ways in which Jesus declares himself to be God and he makes statements unmistakable statements and claims that he is divine, that he is God himself, and he has this unique relationship uh, with God the Father. I love John's Gospel because it gives us this intimate portrait, it gives us such an intimate portrait about Jesus as God himself, as Je about Jesus as the Son of God. And I really like the way that John writes. You have these um, clear statements recorded of Jesus that often have a negative on the one side uh, and, a, and a positive regarding the same matter on the other side. Uh, so one of those statements is found really in verse 32. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, it is not Moses, so the negative, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. So the positive is my father. It's the same talking about this concept of bread on the one hand dealing with a negative, saying Moses did not give you the manna. The positive, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven relating to what is happening now in front of them. So we're constantly presented with this union. We're constantly presented with this idea of the union between God the Father and God the Son. And we get a glimpse into this perfect union of the Godhead, three in one. In every aspect of the ministry and teaching uh, of Jesus, he's doing the will of the Father. And consequently, we as individuals can come to know the Father. We can come to know God as our own Father in a unique way. And the whole purpose of this gospel, the whole purpose of John writing, is so that we might understand and recognise who Jesus is. And that in recognising and understanding who he is, we can then come uh, to know God ourselves and we can be in a relationship with God. When you look at chapter 6, you know, it's full of complex details about the Father and the Son. Things that take uh, a lot of consideration, things that require a lot of study, uh, and but things that will rejoice our heart. The more we think about them, the more we read a passage like this, the more we can treasure what we truly have in Christ and, and the wonderful security of our relationship uh, with him. So uh, they're not easy concepts to come upon, they're not easy things to understand, but the more we the more we learn them by the power of the Holy Spirit within us, by the work of the Spirit revealing truth to us, then the greater will be our rejoicing in the Lord Jesus and in the salvation that we possess. In this chapter, you see large crowds following Jesus and you see that uh, a couple of occasions you get a glimpse into why that they're following him. On the, at the beginning of the chapter, it says, a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick in verse two. And then later on, we see that Jesus says, I tell you the truth, verse 26, I tell you the truth, you are looking for me, not because you saw the miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. So Jesus reveals the heart and we get this couple of glimpses into the fact that, Jesus, that the, the crowds are following him for certain reasons. They're initially following because they see his signs that he's doing, performing uh, miraculous uh, deeds upon the sick. But then they experience the feeding of the 5,000, so their motivation seems to change somewhat. I think it's almost a sense in which they become, they come to see what, what Jesus could do for them personally, and they taste this, this satisfaction from him that's like nothing else, that even in a sense they perhaps not fully experienced uh, in, in, in the healings uh, and, in a, and perhaps seeing others being healed in that way. <coughs> so they've had this experience of Jesus now and they want more. But he's telling them that really they're, they're, they need to think radically different to the way they're approaching things. They're thinking about the here and now. They're thinking about miracles. They're thinking about their stomachs. They're not thinking about eternal matters. And Jesus speaks to them in verse 27 and he says, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. 
So Jesus is telling them to think differently, view things differently. Stop expending energy for the here and now. Start expending energy for the future, for the eternal future. So the miracles that he performed, they were a sign, they were attesting signs that God uh, had put his approval upon his son and that this was in fact the son of God in their midst. But the signs are not the way in which they, they're not the means of them believing. They should believe on the basis of Jesus' words. And then the signs will prove that Jesus is who he said he is. God had provided for Israel in the wilderness journeys. He had miraculously made his presence known uh, through the provision of manna. He had provided for them and he had sustained and fed them. He had kept his people and he'd done that in a supernatural way and he'd done that for their daily needs. He had, he had made himself known in their midst. Now we have the very Son of God present amongst them making himself known as the bread of life. And he's saying to them, don't, don't go in for what doesn't last. Don't work and put in effort for what doesn't endure, but, but go in and put effort and expend your energy for what endures to eternal life. Of course, they interpret this as him telling them they needed to do some work in order to be accepted by God. And he makes it clear that it is faith. It's not the work of God to do a work that, uh, that God requires is to believe in his son. It's to believe that God has sent him, to believe that he himself is God. So it's not a performance-based thing. It's about us believing in the Lord Jesus and receiving salvation as a free gift. He, he can give them, Jesus can give them eternal life. He is making, he, he's making numerous claims to be God and telling them clearly that if they believe in him and if they trust in him, he will give them eternal life and they will never go hungry again. They will never be thirsty again. They obviously still will have physical needs, but spiritually they will be satisfied because God has placed his seal of approval on him. Jesus was, is here present with the people of God. God has made his presence known in the midst of a grumbling people in the past through manner. Jesus is here making his presence known, the very God of heaven, making his presence known amongst a grumbling people uh, in, in the, with the nation of Israel here in this, in this more recent setting. For us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, it is here that we see the great truth of salvation. It's here that we can rejoice our hearts, even when our temporal situation, our current circumstances are difficult in this moment. And we can rejoice ourselves in a number of things. First of all, each of us is given as a gift from the Father to the Son. The Father has given us to the Son and the Son has received us because he's obedient to the Father. He won't turn us away or cast us out. He's here to do the will of God, his Father. And we see that in verses 35 uh, to 38. He's not working independent of the Father. We came to the one who can eternally satisfy us. We will never hunger or be thirsty again. He can satisfy us and we don't need anyone else. We don't need to turn to anyone other than the Lord Jesus. At the end of this chapter, we see Peter, when, when Jesus challenges the disciples and says, well, you also go away. There are people who don't accept what I'm saying. Are you going to turn away? And they reply and respond. Peter says, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. There's no one else who can meet our needs like you. There's no one else who can save as you can save. There's no one else who can satisfy as you can satisfy. So we've got no one else to go to. The Son will never lose us. Just as it's the Father's will to bring us to the Son, so the Son will never lose us and he'll execute the work because he'll raise us up at the last day. The Father, the Son and the Spirit have worked for our eternal security and Jesus is the resurrection and the life and he will raise us up again in the future. We haven't believed in someone who merely originated on earth. He is from heaven, he came down. He has ascended to the very place where he previously was before. He has accomplished the will of the Father by giving his flesh, giving himself, being crucified upon the cross and doing that so that we might have eternal life and that we might ne never taste of the judgment, the second death, and be eternally away from God outside of his presence uh, in darkness and in hell. We live because the living Father in union with the Son has made it possible for us to have eternal life. And when the Father drew us to the Son, the Son received us so that we might never be lost again. 
Though God provided manna in the wilderness, those people still died. They still died. They lost their physical lives. But we have believed in one who has the power to save us and who and has the power to raise us. And we will never die. We will live forever. We will be in heaven in eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ because of who he truly is and because he has been on this earth and given himself for our sakes. In this wonderful union between the Father and the Son, we came to the Son because we listened to and learned from the Father. But at the same time, the Son revealed the Father to us and we can't know the Father without the Son. These are things we can't get our heads around. We can't understand it. If we could, we would be God. We have to accept it. We have to believe it. This wonderful union between the Father and the Son. But it is true. And they have worked the God himself, Father, Son and Spirit, together they have worked, the three persons of the Godhead have worked to save us, to secure us, and nothing can separate us from that reality. At times, maybe like me in all of this, you be a bit worried about what's going on. I've been concerned on occasions for us uh, with food, where it would come from, whether we'd have enough. Uh, but in all of this, it seems a challenge to me in this passage, really, that just as the Lord Jesus spoke to these people and told them not to focus on, on the here and now and expend energy being consumed with, with what won't last. He told them to look to an eternal reality, to trust and believe in him and to appreciate who is, who is in their midst and what he can truly do. So instead of me panicking about the uncertainties of my temporal situation, I can rejoice in the certain salvation that Jesus Christ has provided, knowing that in the future we will be with him and we will be with him forever and nothing can take that away from us at all.
yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood. Thanks to everyone and their involvement for tonight, particularly to Alistair for bringing the word to us. Hope that you will consider these things, pray through them, and that you will be reminded uh, of the fact that Jesus is the bread of life, that in him is all that we need and more than enough satisfaction for our longing souls. I'm going to finish with uh, the words, and I hope you found tonight encouraging. I'm going to finish with the words of prayer, uh, an exhortation again from George Muller, who, who said... Uh, these these final words. He said, My dear Christian reader, will you not try this way? Will you not know for yourself the preciousness and the happiness of this way of casting all of your cares and all of your burdens and necessities upon God? This way is as open to you as it is to me. Everyone is invited to, and commanded to trust in the Lord, to trust in him with all of his heart and to cast his burden upon him and to call upon him in the day of trouble. Will you not do this, my dear brethren in Christ? I long that you may do so. I desire that you may taste the sweetness of that state of heart in which while surrounded by difficulties and necessities, you can yet be at peace because you know, you know that the living God, your Father in heaven, cares for you. Church, go in peace. Amen.